And uh, very pleased now to introduce Commissioner Katie Dykes. Uh, K Commissioner, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I know we had you at the chamber uh, probably about a year ago and uh, a lot has happened since then, but a lot of good things uh, at the department as well. So excited to have you here with us at the Big Connect. Great, thank you so much for that invitation and, and uh, great um, kind introduction, Garrett. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. I'm joining from my dining room, uh, but really thrilled to have the chance to, to speak with everyone today. I know what a just a busy and challenging time this is uh, for so many folks um, in our business community and uh, in the greater New Haven area. Um, we have a lot that we've been delivering on over these last uh, several months uh, as we respond to the pandemic and um, and uh, at the same time continue um, a great progress on many of our priorities around um, you know, our, our full kind of mission of, of outdoor recreation, protecting natural resources, um, supporting our clean energy transition, and uh, as well improving the predictability and uh, transparency and efficiency of our permitting processes. So I just really wanted to um, have a few, you know, this opportunity to tell you a little bit about some of the things that we're doing um, and to have a chance to get some feedback on, on how we're doing it deep, things that we could be doing better. It matters a lot uh, to, to us to ensure that we're um, delivering on, you know, permitting processes that are streamlined and can um, help uh, provide answers to developers and make Connecticut a, a really positive place to do business. It matters a lot to us that um, the investments that we're making in our natural resources and outdoor recreation programs are um, helping to support, you know, the quality of life in Connecticut that we know um, many of your employees um, um, value, you know, one of the things that attracts a really high caliber workforce um, in our state. It matters a lot to us um, that as we're delivering on clean energy programs um, and, and helping folks uh, make this transition um, uh, to a cleaner future, that we're doing so in a way that is um, uh, trying to minimize costs as much as possible um, uh, of electricity in a state that has very high energy costs. And we know what that means in terms of business competitiveness. Um, and so these are just a few of the areas that we're really focused on. Um, maybe I'll talk a little bit about uh, what we've been doing um, you know, through the pandemic. Obviously, uh, one of the areas of our mission that has, has kept us especially busy um, in the spring and summer months is outdoor recreation. And you know, our parks are just such an incredibly valuable economic, social, um, and public health resource when you think about it. And, and certainly during the spring, um, we saw uh, that, that uh, you know, play out in real time as many opportunities were, uh, typical recreation opportunities were closed uh, to families across the state. Uh, people turned out um, in significant numbers to enjoy hiking opportunities and time at the shoreline uh, during the warmer months. We saw a 50% increase in our trail use across the state. And our park visitorship, you know, we implemented um, lower parking capacity at some of our most popular parks in order to help um, uh, keep the visitor levels at a, at a, at a reasonable level where we could um, ensure that social distancing would uh, be occurring. Um, and even with lowering parking capacity, we saw that park visitorship was up by 20% um, overall for, for the year, uh, despite those capacity limits being put in place. Um, we opened our hunting, uh, or sorry, our fishing season um, early for inland fishing uh, in order to avoid opening day crowds. Um, and we have made a lot of modifications uh, to shift some of our hunter education um, and licensing online in, in certain circumstances to be able to adapt that to um, social distancing. And as a result, we saw that hunting and fishing licenses both increased over the previous year for the first time um, in a decade. Boating sales and participation in online licensing programs also well above average. Our boat ramps um, were routinely at capacity. You know, so we don't really, um, I think, talk enough about the importance of our outdoor recreation assets in this state and how it contributes um, to Connecticut's you know, attractiveness um, for uh, a, a really high quality workforce um, and for families to, to stay um, or to relocate. But I think um, you know, that's certainly been part of what we've observed uh, the, through the pandemic is that we have a park within 15 minutes of every person in the state. 
Uh, and so that accessibility to outdoor recreation um, opportunities, I think, was really um, you know valued during this time. And um, and we also saw uh, the importance of outdoor recreation um, as an economic driver too. Um, our our parks are helping to support a nearly four billion dollar industry of outdoor recreation. Um, and Connecticut, you know, because of our accessibility of our natural resources, I think. Um, has been able to, you know, support a lot of economic activity in, in hunting and fishing um, and, and other types of recreation uh, throughout the summer. So um, it's just a, a, I've just mentioned this, um, not really a typical topic that we hear a lot of business groups asking us about, but I think it's just really important to emphasize and, and let people know, um, you know, what we've been observing with these programs and, and, uh, and, and how popular and how important we think that they have, have really become uh, for, for folks in Connecticut. And, you know, we support these programs through the Passport, or our parks through um, the Passport to Parks program, which has been invaluable in providing stable funding for these efforts. It was enacted in 2017, um, and it uh, applies a, a modest $5 surcharge on annual vehicle registrations um, in Connecticut to fund our park operating costs. It's, that was absolutely critical for us to be able to maintain um, levels of service and, and um, provide enhanced service in certain places to support social distancing. And through the Passport program, we've been able to eliminate parking fees for all Connecticut residents. Uh, so that really um, facilitated a lot of accessibility for uh, folks in Connecticut for these park assets during the summer. Um, so it's just, it's just an incredibly important program, maybe not one that um, comes up on people's radars, uh, very often at the chamber level, but has been really essential for us to be able to um, deliver on uh, quality outdoor recreation opportunities that are so valued um, by the people of our state. Um, just shifting over to our environmental quality program. So we manage, of course, over 125 different permitting processes. Last time that I had the opportunity to speak uh, to um, to this group, we were just launching our 20 by 20 initiative. And for folks who may not be familiar with that, you can Google um, 20 by 20 and see uh, the progress on our website. We adopted 20 performance goals uh, that we committed to achieve, um, uh, advance by the end of this calendar year, so December 2020. And we also committed to, uh, and, and these relate to improving the transparency and the efficiency and the predictability of our various permitting processes, um, both to achieve better environmental outcomes as well as to provide for um, better uh, uh, experience for um, applicants and regulated entities. Um, I'm so proud of what our team has accomplished uh, in moving these 20 by 20 goals ahead, even as um, you know, hundreds of our employees have shifted to um, telework and have been balancing, uh, as, as many of us have, you know, lots of um, uh, personal, you know, challenges in terms of uh, uh, online learning for kids who've been at home or um, uh, caring for elderly family members and so on. Um, it, our team has, has really prioritized continued progress um, towards these 20 by 20 goals, which, and, and they, the, each of these goals really shine a spotlight on, on key measures um, that I think have become even more important uh, during the pandemic. One example is digitization. We have a lot of um, records at our department that are really important for attorneys doing due diligence on transactions. Um, and heretofore, they were all uh, only accessible in paper through an a in-person visit to our file room. Um, we had started digitization of some of those most requested documents prior to the pandemic. And that I think has been really helpful um, at, for folks to be able to then access those uh, documents safely and remotely um, during, during this time period. We have been um, providing for uh, greater access to the file room. Obviously there's a lot more documents that haven't been digitized yet. Um, and so we have been really sensitive to that um, to try to provide for safe access to the file room. Um, but our long-term goal is to continue with that digitization project. Another really important aspect is um, uh, around our transformation of our uh, cleanup programs for contaminated sites. And so um, if folks are, uh, didn't uh, catch the exciting news from the special session in, in September, uh, we secured unanimous support in both chambers of the legislature for a landmark bill um, that will 
uh, sunset over time, the Transfer Act, which is um, the uh, legacy program that we've had in place in Connecticut uh, to govern the cleanup of contaminated uh, sites um, and replace it with a release-based system uh, that is you know, much more in common uh, and, and best practice among 48 other states in, in, the, in the US. Um, under a release-based system, uh, we think that this is a much more workable. It's much more uh, consistent with other jurisdictions. Um, it, we no longer will require uh, owners of contaminated sites to go out and pr to prove the negative um, and to do exhaustive investigations to prove that there's no contamination um, located there. A release-based system really uh, turns on um, the, you know, leverages the um, interest that we know um, banks and investors already have to limit liability and to ensure that um, purchasers of properties, owners of properties um, are aware of, of contamination. Uh, and so we really want to, the, the, a release-based system um, really turns on um, if you find it, you know, clean it up, uh, that sort of principle. Um, it's going to be a complex a set of regulations that DEEP will be promulgating um, under this new statutory authorization to implement this program. Um, I'm really excited that we are launching um, a working group that was called for in the legislation uh, that will ensure that um, stakeholders have a chance to be part of the discussions and the deliberations uh, with DEEP um, in partnership with uh, DECD um, as we develop this, this set of regulations to move this landmark um, new framework forward. Um, and so look for um, updates uh, through our website, um, or you can email Graham Stevens um, at ct.gov. He's our uh, bureau chief uh, who will be um, spearheading uh, this uh, reform movement going forward and is working on coordinating um, that working group. But we are, uh, we'll have a formal working group that will be developing the regulations, um, many subcommittees to dive into specific details. Um, of, of the regulation design, all before we put even start to put pen to paper um, on a draft to uh, go to notice and, and seek public comment. Um, that's something that's really just personally very important to me uh, that, uh, you know, the deep not appear like a black box. Um, we want to make the best regulatory designs are ones that support and foster good compliance and leverage the, um, uh, what the private market is already doing uh, to prioritize environmental cleanups. We're really uh, very fortunate to have a strong community of licensed environmental professionals, for example, across the state who provide counsel to, um, to businesses every day uh, on how to address contamination. And I'm really optimistic that the regulation we designed will help um, to build on uh, that, that network of, of LEPs and the services they provide um, to help us uh, manage um, and, and, and calibrate um, the, the oversight that DEEP provides um, to contamination that really presents the highest risk um, to uh, the environment and to public health, um, but, but uh, at the same time being able to rely um, on LEPs to manage uh, directly with their clients um, a lot of the, the more mundane and lower risk um, contamination or spills. Uh, that are out there. So we're really excited about that project moving forward. At the same time, one of our 20 by 20 or two of our 20 by 20 goals have been to advance regulatory packages that were already underway uh, for the remediation standard regulations and environmental use restrictions. Um, these will be uh, harmonized with the, for the future uh, release-based system, but we're excited to see those come into place um, very soon. The, re the um, uh, REGS Review Committee in the legislature um, it has those under consideration, and we hope that the, the final packages will be adopted. These will provide for um, more standard, uh, um, uh, well, standards for cleanups um, that uh, apply both under the Transfer Act and more broadly. Um, and as well as flexible uh, flexibility for uh, for cleanups um, to, for example, um, ensure that uh, a cleanup of a site, um, if the future use is contemplated as a manufacturer, um, it does not necessarily need to be um, uh, cleaned up to the same level as if uh, the the uh, future site is or the site is going to be used for a daycare 
for example, but um, the EUR uh, package will help just to ensure that there's proper notification and um, deed restrictions recorded um, so that uh, we can um, embrace those types of flexible endpoints um, and tiered cleanup uh, uh, objectives um, based on, on expected land use. And I think that's another thing that will be an engine of, of getting clean, contaminated sites cleaned up. I know I don't have to um, remind this group about why all of this is so important. Um, you know, for many of our urban communities, the legacy of our industrial past is with us today in terms of uh, contaminated brownfields that are located next to prime uh, transportation and energy infrastructure um, and very accessible to our, our workforce, um, but may be stuck um, in a broken uh, cleanup uh, regulation regime like the Transfer Act. And so we're really, uh, you know, as folks were asking us, well, why is the administration really prioritizing um, moving ahead with the, the Transfer Act or release-based program during a special session? The pandemic is a, a perfect example of why, um, you know, as we think about fiscal stimulus and monetary policy and all those macroeconomic tools uh, that we need to help get businesses on their feet, um, we're doing everything that we can within uh, within the Lamont administration uh, to also prioritize regulatory relief, um, things that we can do to also stimulate um, and support uh, economic development in our state um, by removing uh, laws and regulations that are really barriers to development. And so eager to hear um, other, you know, additional ideas of places that we should be focused in that regard, uh, whether in the Q&A or in emails afterwards. Um, but, you know, I think if you look at the 20 by 20 report, you see we have, um, we have a great appetite uh, at DEEP to be able to um, provide for streamlining of, of our regulations. Um, we're going to see a lot of our employees retiring um, and leaving state service between now and 2022. And so this is really a critical time uh, for us to look hard at all of our permitting and regulatory processes to figure out if they're really providing value for, um, for our, uh, um, our mission of protecting the environment as well as for uh, fostering um, efficient compliance from the business community. And we're very open to suggestions and ideas of additional things that we should be looking at. Um, in many cases, uh, our folk, you know, we find um, great value in moving from individual permits to establishing general permits that can provide for a faster turnaround um, for projects that fit within certain uh, criteria where there's not great risk. Or even uh, we've advanced uh, proposals to move from general permits to permit by rule. Um, where uh, we, you know, uh, anticipate that the environmental impact um, is so modest um, that we, you know, we can really place the burden of compliance um, on the uh, regulated entity without requiring um, a, an application or a permit approval from from deep affirmatively. So we're looking for, you know, every opportunity that we can. Um, to again adjust our how we're spending our time and our our resources and our manpower um, to focus on those types of activities that are highest risk and greatest reward for environmental protection and and to um, uh, move away from and minimize the amount of time we're spending on uh, permitting processes that are not really uh, uh, delivering on on that highest objective. So um, eager to continue our progress there. Another thing that I wanted to just mention to folks, uh, again, through our 20 by 20 effort um, has been a focus on uh, providing greater accessibility um, for uh, the business community to get answers and have um, a, a, you know, responsiveness um, from our staff um, and from our various permitting programs. We already have a very popular pre-application process um, that we encourage folks to uh, talk to us about whenever you anticipate that you might have a permitting action um, uh, coming before DEEP. Um, it's just been really uh, especially helpful um, and our, we have uh, very knowledgeable staff um, who uh, have administered this program for some time. It's especially helpful if you have a project um, where you anticipate you may need more than one uh, permit approval from, from DEEP. Our pre-application process is especially helpful uh, um, in guiding people to know which door to knock on um, and in what sequence. Um, but we have also established, in addition to that, a new um, concierge program um, where uh, we have dedicated staff um, who are providing for 
a, 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 um, a one-stop shop um, experience where you can have a single point of contact for the applicant um, to be able to check in and get information about the status of a permit um, to follow up on after your permit application, your pre-application um, assistance uh, to be able to help get someone to help you uh, with coordinating meetings or following up on complex permitting projects, um, especially if they might involve DEEP and other um, state agencies. And so um, if you haven't already learned about our client concierge program, please do check out. Um, you can Google the website or send an email to our client concierge team at deep.concierge at ct.gov. Um, we're really excited you know, um, to hear from folks, um, have you reach out um, to the concierge team. They're standing by to provide assistance. And we'd love to also get feedback um, about what kind of assistance is most helpful. Um, you know, we're very eager uh, to have a good interface and uh, provide great responsiveness and, um, and, and build our capacity um, to uh, provide for efficient process with the business community. Um, and it's really helpful for us to hear um, what's most useful at what stage of project development, what kind of information is most helpful. If there are other states that are doing this, um, uh, providing this type of assistance in a way that, that, is, uh, that you really like, um, just letting us know what models have been really impactful and effective. Um, we're really eager to hear that kind of feedback as we um, uh, continue to grow this concierge team. So those are just a few examples of some of the things that we've been working on within the environmental quality uh, branch. There's there's so much more to say. Um, um, actually, per, perhaps one that I should just mention relates to waste. Um, we've been spending quite a bit of time on uh, municipal solid waste and solid waste issues in the state. As we know, we're really uh, uh, eyeing a, a potential or a real a crisis that's on the horizon for us um, as uh, much of our waste to energy disposal um, infrastructure in the state is nearing the end of useful life and requiring um, more um, uh, more investment uh, to continue. Uh, we also know that uh, landfilling out of state is becoming an increasingly cost competitive option as more um, uh, businesses and municipalities um, see their tip fees for uh, sending waste to waste energy facilities increasing significantly in recent years. Um, at the same time, there's going to be, um, you know, a fair amount of challenges around uh, landfill capacity in the Northeast, uh, we, we expect to reduce by 40% by 2026. And so even landfilling in the region is going to be more costly and more challenging. So we've launched a process called the Connecticut Coalition for Sustainable Materials Management, um, working together with 74 towns who opted to join into this coalition to look at ways that we can scale sustainable materials management strategies. Um, to help uh, uh, provide for lower cost and more sustainable and more self-sufficient um, waste options going into the future. So I think I highlight that to you just as um, on the one hand, a business opportunity where we want to spur more development of anaerobic digestion and um, innovative uh, uh, sustainable waste solutions in the state, um, as well as uh, to let you know that um, from a competitiveness standpoint, you know, we're very focused on waste costs um, escalating in the state and, and much of this effort, uh, we hope will help to uh, provide for less volatility in disposal costs, um, both for municipalities and for businesses. Uh, last, and I, I should, uh, I'll, I'll go quickly because I, I know uh, there's a lot of information. I can't, I, I'd love to hear some questions too, uh, but energy um, has been a major, major focus for us throughout the pandemic. We have, as, as DEEP administers and provides oversight of the uh, state's energy efficiency programs, um, you know, we've focused a lot on making sure that our energy efficiency vendors, these are small businesses across the state that are, um, provide for a lot of employment, uh, making sure that they there's content, there was continuity for them uh, to be able to continue their operations in a safe manner during the pandemic, um, as well as ensuring that businesses um, who've been impacted by the economic downturn and are struggling with um, energy costs uh, can uh, have greater accessibility to energy efficiency programs as uh, just as one additional measure um, to help uh, lower their bills and make their operating costs more efficient. Um, so we deep increase the incentive levels and the percentage cap of project costs that's paid for, for a project um, uh, for many of our CNI 
I programs um, so that incentives could cover a greater portion of the project costs. Um, we've allowed for a six month deferral of starting loan paybacks, um, again, to provide more flexibility for C uh, commercial and industrial customers so that they could see a bigger net positive cash flow from efficiency measures up front. Um, so, you know, we, I just want to highlight uh, that uh, if you've considered energy efficiency measures in the past, um, and haven't looked at these options more recently, uh, it's worth taking another, um, taking another turn and checking out energizedct.com or contacting UI um, about uh, these programs because we have worked hard during these, this time period to ensure that these programs can be really responsive to business needs. Energy costs, of course, and aff affordability have also been a, a major focus for us um, at the wholesale level. Um, we know that folks saw increases on their bills um, uh, and uh, on their electricity rates coming in the summer, um, partly it, in large part driven by um, a lot of challenges that we've been facing in the ISO New England wholesale electricity markets. Transmission rates uh, went up. Those are FERC approved and get directly passed on um, to Connecticut repairs. At the same time, Connecticut repairs are paying for the cost of things like the Millstone nuclear power plant. Um, you know, doing so, uh, retaining that plant, of course, helped us avoid much higher um, energy price increases uh, where we expected that that plant would shut down without support. But we are working very hard to ensure that um, that the cost of retaining that facility, which really, you know, that facility is a regional asset. It benefits the entire New England region, um, just given how big it is and the um, unique characteristics of that facility to, to help uh, contribute to the reliability of the grid. And so we've been very focused over the last few months with conversations with the ICE New England and with our uh, sister New England states um, about uh, pursuing reforms to the ICE New England market design that would ensure that our state and our ratepayers um, don't have to pay twice uh, for um, uh, uh, our for our electric grid. Um, that we are getting credit in the new in, in the ISA New England market um, for uh, the contracts and the investments that we've been making, uh, both uh, related to the nuclear facility uh, for reliability as well as for um, off, uh, many of our clean energy resources. And so um, I'm very uh, excited. Governor Lamont was joined by four other New England governors in issuing um, a, a call um, uh, earlier this fall uh, for reforms to the ISA New England market. And uh, the states, all six states are working together um, on uh, options uh, to pursue those reforms. And again, this is uh, wonky stuff and um, you know, uh, a lot of technical details go into it, but I just highlight this um, because these are, um, you know, the ICE in New England uh, and their market designs um, uh, drive hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of cost impacts to our rate pairs um, that, that doesn't often get covered or talked about. But for high energy users, our industrial customers, uh, commercial customers, uh, we know that makes a difference between be staying competitive um, here in the state vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis, um, other you know, competitors that are uh, outside of New England. And this is what we're working on here in these reforms is very much um, uh, focused on helping to improve the affordability of energy um, for uh, businesses in the state. So I'm going to stop there. Um, it's a lot, uh, uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe a little too much. Um, uh, you know, I hope I didn't overwhelm or speak too quickly, but uh, it does give you a sense of some of the things that have been keeping us very busy over these last few months, working hard to serve um, the businesses and families of the state. And I, uh, Garrett, I just appreciate the opportunity to have a chance to tell people what we've been working on. And, um, you, you know, I just can't tell you enough how important it is to get that feedback um, directly from folks, whether it's on, in some Q&A if we have time or um, by email afterwards. Um, it, it helps us prioritize, you know, what we're working on and, and you, par good partnership and communication with the business community is, is very important to me as commissioner. Oh, thanks, Katie. Uh, we appreciate you being on here. Um, I want to open it up to anyone who has questions. They can put it in the uh, chat and we'll, we'll get those uh, going. Um, Commissioner, I, I know uh, you were just talking about collaboration. I know you work with DCD Commissioner uh, David Lehman a lot. Can you just talk about how the, the administration tries to work uh, across multiple agencies? You know, David's been a phenomenal partner. Um, the Transfer Act uh, bill and getting the release based authorization, I think. Uh, I, I, I think that's like our, our um, my favorite uh, of our accomplishments together. 
I, I don't think we would have been able to um, get that enacted without um, you know, having such a strong partnership with DECD. Um, you know, David, I know, had the ear of a lot of business groups and folks who, uh, manufacturers and others who, you know, had questions and, and had great input and feedback. Um, and, and of course, we were hearing from a lot of folks uh, as well as the environmental advocates. Um, you know, he's, he's been a terrific partner. Um, and as the governor, you know, as we went to the governor and talked to him about this opportunity and putting this on the agenda for special session, it was, it was like, you know, it was like, look, we both agree on this. This is a good thing for the environment and for business. And he said, bring me more things like this. When David and Katie agree, it's like a good thing for the state. So we're, we're looking for more opportunities to work together. He's a real, a real pleasure and a real, I think, asset uh, for the administration and for our state. No, that, that is always great when um, environmental and economic interests can align. Uh, I do see a question here about West Rock and uh, I'll just read it um, being such a landmark and a parking lot regularly full. Um, I think I know we've experienced a lot of full parking lots over the last uh, several months, um, but any ways for partnerships to kind of expand uh, parking, more access to uh, really any of our parks, but here in this situation, West, West Rock. That's great. Yeah. So, um, you know, we have, of course, a one of my favorite programs is our open space grant program. Um, and through in partnership with municipalities and with land trusts, we've been able to uh, run successful grant rounds every year. Um, and we get incredible uh, proposals and with a limited amount of bond funding, we've been able to match and leverage on um, private and municipal dollars to um, help uh, preserve um, and provide for permanent public access to some incredibly special places all around the state. We know how uh, valuable that is, especially you know, in a community um, to have that access and what that contributes. Um, so uh, you know, we, I, I encourage folks, if you haven't um, participated in that process or if you've got specific parcels that, that um, you know, may be coming um, available uh, to get involved with our open space grant program, it's incredibly Wonderful. The other thing, um, we have seen a lot of visitorship, um, a lot of increases. I was surprised the question wasn't about Sleeping Giant. Um, <laughs> but uh, but every place, all of our um, uh, our outdoor recreation spaces are getting a tremendous amount of use. So we, we are doing a lot of messaging to try to encourage people to space out and try um, those less popular, less traveled, less or more undiscovered um, parks and locations around the state. I think that's really been positive. Um, or to try to visit during, you know, during the week or um, early morning and that sort of thing. Um, it's just been surprising. I thought that things would quiet down a bit in the fall, to be honest. And uh, the visitorship is still really high, which is a great thing, by the way. I celebrate that, but it means, um, you know, being extra careful about leaving no trace, um, you know, carry in, carry out, being sensitive to, um, you know, these trails are getting a lot of use and that sort of thing. And if you haven't volunteered before, um, we have wonderful um, friends of parks groups, like the uh, Friends of Sleeping Giant, for example, and they to help us tremendously to be able to provide these uh, uh, facilities in, in great, um, great condition for the public to enjoy. Yeah, you're right. I mean, in some ways it's a rediscovery or a first time discovery for some people of the beauty of the state and the just, you know, really varied uh, geography that we have. Yeah. Um, I have a question here about um, the Transfer Act and how high a priority will the new release-based remediation program be and when is deep targeting to have them done? Oh yes, um, very, very high priority. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that has been challenging to us for deep um, is where you've seen kind of regulation or regulatory uh, packages get started and processes get started and then um, something else bumps it off the priority list and time passes and then people haven't seen the draft in a while and then it pops up again and people are surprised about what's in it. Um, you know, I can point to a couple examples like that and where those conversations get deprioritized or interrupted, that's what contributes to kind of, you know, a lack of trust or, or a feeling that there's really no predictability or transparency about what DEEP is doing or what might be coming. So um, this is a huge deal. And I will say we are very motivated to get this done. Um, I, I won't I won't say what my preferred end date would be because um, uh, it would break uh, our staff morale, I think. <laughs> but 
But at the same time, I will say um, we want to move very quickly and not, so, I mean, you know, we don't want to move so quickly that we can't, we lose, lose the opportunity for conversation with stakeholders. Um, so we want, you know, this is all, this needs to be something that um, is a priority for everyone else as well. Uh, but we want to get this done so that we can have a really um, uh, uh, consistent conversation um, and provide for that good momentum to bring us forward. And I'll tell you, no one's more uh, motivated to do this actually than our staff. Uh, because you know many of them are going to be retiring in 2022 and as we transform to a new program um, and hopefully have the ability to refill those positions we actually will probably need different types of expertise and different types of staffing than that we would if we were just continuing on to the transfer act so for folks who um, have dedicated 30 years of their careers to implementing the transfer act and who um, see how we could do better on release based, you know, these are the men and women that are on my team that are that are working hard to get this done because they want um, to hand off, you know, when they retire, a brand new shiny program that's even more effective, that leverages their experience, but ensures that we're really positioned to, to deliver on environmental quality outcomes in a more efficient way going forward with the right kind of staffing. And so, um, did I say 2022? But in any case, we're <laughs> we're excited. And um, so do look at our website where we will be putting out a notice. If it's not already out, it'll go up tomorrow or, or email Graham Stevens um, at ct.gov. I can put his email here. Um, I, we're circle your calendar. I think December 8th will probably be the first um, kickoff meeting of the working group and all those working group meetings will be open to the public. And um, you know there was unanimous support from everyone I talked to for uh, getting rid of the Transfer Act the only concern I heard from people is, well, you know, what's, you know, what are those details going to be um, when the department start work, starts working on it? But just to hear you and, and repeat it, it's going to be the working group is the way that private sector can be involved in that process. Yes, absolutely. And the working group, they'll, so there'll be like one, uh, a working group that meets monthly that'll be sort of like the steering group, the steering committee. And then we're going to proliferate probably six or seven subcommittees. Um, that will dive into specific um, aspects of the regulation. Um, and we're gonna be looking for folks to give us proposals or white papers or you know, put in your concept papers um, in those subcommittees and then um, get feedback on that. And so that when we start to actually draft the reg, um, folks have had a chance to really give us their best information about how we should design this. Look, we're really, um, in some ways, it's a little disruptive to go from one regime to the other as opposed to like starting off, right, from scratch. But on the other hand, we get the benefit of knowing how all these other jurisdictions do it. We have many LEPs in the state and environmental attorneys who've worked in Massachusetts and other neighboring areas that have release-based systems. So we're really excited to stand on the shoulders of, um, of those other programs and try to uh, match and import what's worked well. Um, and hopefully that will make our jobs a little easier. Uh, there's obviously a lot of differences between the outgoing uh, federal administration and the incoming uh, administration in environmental law. Will uh, people in Connecticut see that through deep? Do, is there any change uh, on the state or local level based on what happens at the federal? <laughs> That's a really great question. Um, certainly with respect to climate and clean energy investment, I'm, I'm excited about, you know, um, we will, I, I, I expect, um, not have to spend as much time uh, creating state level backstops, you know, to enact things like appliance standards or regulations of hydrofluorocarbons or other types of things that are just incredibly impactful, cost effective, um, no brainer uh, measures, um, but would be better to be implemented at, in a standardized way at the federal level. Um, I'm also optimistic about with different leadership that again, um, we might see the, the permitting and citing processes for things like offshore wind, which are gonna be a major economic driver for our state. Um, I expect that will potentially to move more smoothly um, and have greater predictability about um, that, that industry taking off. One other that um, I didn't talk about in my main comments, but I think is another really important one for the New Haven area and for our state as a whole, relates to investment in climate resilience. Um, we have, uh, you know, um, the Governor's Council on Climate Change has been working through this, this last year um, with specific focuses on financing, um, adaptation and resilience. There's an enormous amount of um, insured value for property in Connecticut is along the coasts. 
And so um, this is uh, could be an incredible vulnerability for our economy if we if we unless we have um, a really proactive investment in things like um, uh, flood control measures, um, tide tide gates, you know, all kinds of ber berms and other infrastructure as well as um, green infrastructure that can help better absorb intense uh, rainfall events and and prevent downstream flooding. Um, we, we know what the measures are, but we, and we know that how valuable these are, um, but we need to really build out the um, investment and, you know, in order to uh, launch these projects. And so I think that's going to be a major focus for us in 2021. And obviously the best way for us to improve our resilience um, along the coast and throughout the state um, is by matching our state dollars with federal dollars. And so I hope that climate resilience can be a major opportunity um, as we think about infrastructure bills that might move forward and things of that nature. And I know that that will really uh, provide for, for greater predictability and retaining value um, in our high value coastal properties um, for businesses and families around the state. Um, on the energy side, natural gas is such a big part of our fuel mix uh, for electricity heating. Um, I, I know that's been on the national stage, uh, fracking, things like that. Fracking is where we got a lot of this uh, additional natural gas. Um, do you expect changes in that? Do you think that there's going to be a pullback from natural gas? Um, that, you know, that will be really interesting to see at the federal level. Um, a lot of the regulation for uh, natural gas distribution, right, um, expansion projects and so on is really at the state utility commission level. Um, and you know, while we have really taken a look, and I think we'll we'll probably look um, further when we launch our our upcoming comprehensive energy strategy process at the gas expansion program that was established um, many years ago, and particularly its focus on expanding for resident you know hookups for new residential customers. We know how important and and you know uh, natural gas is for industrial um, and commercial uses, and there aren't as many um, uh, green alternatives, if you will, um, uh, for those large industrial or commercial uses for for natural gas. But I will say, from the federal standpoint, you know I think that there's opportunities for um, uh, um, you know methane leakage from gas production. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it, it just doesn't make sense uh, to not put in best practices and incent the producers um, to put in best practices to prevent um, leakage from occurring. This is a major contributor to methane emissions across, um, across this, the country um, and would help to improve the emissions profile of natural gas, you know, overall. So, um, you know, in conversations that we've had with, with states that, that have a lot of um, gas production, you know, they, they want to have funding for plugging abandoned wells and, you know, addressing some of that leakage. And I think that that would help, um, you know, th those types of things, I think the Obama administration was moving forward with um, and, and would seem like early priorities to pick up and, and address from, uh, you know, if you're if, uh, it, early in the administration. So, uh, but there's certainly a lot more, a lot more to come, I, I'm sure. And we'll, we'll look forward to seeing uh, how the Biden administration's priorities uh, advance. Um, we had a question here about uh, renewables, and I know you already talked about wind. Um, mm -hmm. Wind is big for Connecticut. Any other renewables that we're looking at as, as yeah, yeah, great can. question there. So, by the way, and this is another win-win um, that I love working on with with uh, with David Lehman. Um, we've had great partnership and engagement from DECD on the economic development side of offshore wind, um, and. and uh, I'm excited about what that means. We've seen here already approve the contract for both the Beard Wills for Revolution Wind. So once we support the same permit, we will have about 20% of um, Connecticut's energy supply coming from offshore wind. And so we're excited now um, to have the focus on how do we lock in as much economic development as possible um, here in our state around uh, the deployment of offshore wind. So that means um, support for workforce development as well as port development um, and supply chain. Um, as we have precision manufacturers you know, across the state, we're well poised to be um, uh, supplying the offshore wind industry with components um, here in the state. Solar, also another obviously major big focus and, and economic driver for the state. Um, we are gonna be coming out within the next four weeks with our draft integrated resources plan, um, which will map out 
pathways to achieve the 100% zero carbon electric grid target that Governor Lamont has called uh, called for um, our state to meet by 2040. And um, it highlights uh, offshore wind and solar energy efficiency um, and other types of renewables as already contributing an, an enormous amount um, you know, uh, to meeting that objective. People think 100% is gonna be really difficult to reach, but we are already pretty well on our way um, to meeting that target because of the success of programs we've already put into place. And then we want to see um, you know, some reasonable forward progress over time. And that will mean continued investment in things like wind and solar um, transmission efficiency and storage, I think is another exciting one um, that we see emerging. So it's, we're gonna continue to be pretty busy um, on the renewable and, and, and a zero carbon energy side. Um, Katie, you mentioned on uh, that become more digital at the uh, department. I know that was a goal before the pandemic. I'm mm -hmm. sure that's uh, accelerated just because of the current conditions, but um, that should help the customer side to be able to better interact. Yes, absolutely. And so it's another great example. If you have, um, it, you know, we, we really, really I, I just can't say enough how much we appreciate hearing when you're hitting into roadblocks or if you have ideas for things that we need to prioritize, either passing those through Garrett or sending those directly to me. Um, it really matters a lot and people, you know, uh, so, so for example, when we are prioritizing our list of what to digitize next, um, in many cases, we're, we're doing that prioritization based on what gets requested through FOIA um, most frequently. What are our most frequently requested documents? Um, but if folks have um, feedback for us on other types of, you know, ways to prioritize or consider what to digitize, um, please let us know uh, because we want to do more of that. We've developed an online portal um, for document searches. We're moving um, to do more. And uh, it's just a matter of, you know, getting getting the document, getting the scanning done. Um, and in the meantime, you know, obviously we're seeing case counts increase across the state. We've been focused on pro providing more access um, for more hours of, of visiting hours for the uh, our our document center, um, our record center. But um, you know, to the extent that folks may not be able to come in in person, we have also been providing for um, a remote retrieval for people to put in requests. It takes a little while for us to turn it around, but we've been able to scan and send requests um, as they come in and as we have capacity to do that. So just wanted to let let folks know about that. I know how important this access is for keeping transactions going. And so, you know, that's why we just, um, we, we know it's critical and we're trying to balance the safety of our staff and our best visitors, but um, this is a major part of our focus on keeping productivity going um, during the pandemic. And Katie, um, you have such a customer uh, focused approach to the department and, uh, you know, this is kind of a broad question, but the number one complaint I hear from a lot of our businesses is, Oh, you know, we're doing everything we can to follow the regulations, but our person from deep was very inflexible. They're not listening to us. I, I know that's a very general kind of complaint to respond mm -hmm. to, but for businesses out there, um, if they feel like they're running into that wall, uh, not to undercut your staff, but what's what's the best way for them to deal with the, with the department? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's where the client concierge team, you know, comes into play. Uh, if it's in a permitting, uh, context or or otherwise, um, at, you know, the concierge sort of provides for that one stop um, shop that one you know to have a, a kind of a direct kind of contact in person that um, folks can relay concerns to. So to the extent that you know, I get it. Sometimes like you're, you know, the direct staffer you may be working on, you don't want to offend them. <laughs> right. Um, uh, but, you know, if there's, there's feedback to provide or questions to that, you want to just have another set of eyes, kind of take a look at, um, you know, passing that through the, the deep dot concierge at ct.gov um, could be a place to provide that feedback. Um, also, you know, I, if folks haven't had a chance to meet um, Betsy Wingfield on our team, um, I found her to be incredible. She's our deputy commissioner for environmental quality. I found her to be incredibly 
um, um, curious and interested and, and dedicated to follow up on, you know, uh, if folks, if there's an issue that's elevated, you know, to get to the bottom of like why uh, folks feel that we're being inflexible or is there a different way to look at this? And I think um, I, I tapped her for that role because she's very fair, she's very experienced. Um, and, and I think she's she's been very focused on um, helping to make sure that people get um, get the get the right answer. Um, you know, the other challenge that we are also facing, I, I in things that the feedback that I hear sometimes, Garrett, too, is um, when you have an inspection, right? And uh, you know, we have a lot of seasoned employees, like with decades of experience, who you know I'll hear from a manufacturer who says, "Oh my gosh, you know." Deep employee X, like, you know, we've been dealing with for years, he, he comes out, we tell him what we want to do, he's giving us four or five different ideas of how to reconfigure so that we can like fit within the standards and it's so helpful, the troubleshooting is great. Many of those seasoned employees are, are leaving state service. And so, um, you know, that means we're bringing in, you know, uh, new faces and, and folks who, who may not have, you know, that depth of knowledge. Um, we're working hard uh, to be able to refill positions so we can have the overlap and the succession planning and the transfer of knowledge. Um, but we do recognize that is one of the challenges that sometimes folks are facing when we have a, a lot of this turnover occurring in our staffing. So, you know, feedback also is helpful in those contexts so we can ensure that we're providing you know, good training and assistance and, um, and, and as much as possible, consistent um, kind of support um, for compliance across our programs. Great. Well, Commissioner, thank you so much for spending so much time with us. Um, and like I said, second time you've been with us, I'm sure there'll be a third and fourth. We appreciate that you're so uh, approachable and that businesses can can get in touch with you. Absolutely. I really appreciate the opportunity for these conversations and please don't hesitate to reach out anytime. Um, we've got a lot that we can accomplish together. And uh, so I appreciate being with you and look forward to the next time. <laughs> All right. Great. Take Thanks care. Thanks a lot, Mr. Appreciate okay, it. Have a good bye -bye. day. All right. Well, we're continuing on with the uh, Big Connect uh, presented by Comcast Business. We're going to get to our next panel in a few moments. Um, right at the top of the hour at noon, we'll be uh, talking with our bioscience panel. Uh, very excited to get into that conversation. In the meantime, we'll hear from a few of our sponsors. Again, you're at the Big Connect presented by Comcast Business, and today's sponsor is AMS Practice Management. So you're a small business. The world is changing. Hey. Protect the environment. I'll come back on because we're having some problems with the uh, video there. Um, uh, we will at get AMS to practice our, management. Um, we are recruiting our next panel in just a moment. Uh, actually, if we'll bring up the slide right now, just let everyone know about the the Zoom lounge is available uh, for everyone. If you want to go over there for networking opportunities, and again, our uh, exhibitor hall is also open. You have a chance to win a free pass to Foxwoods. Uh, we have a room giveaway, dinner and also an opportunity to go to the race karting as well. Uh, the only way to get into that, you have to go visit some of our exhibitors, go in, claim a deal, post the comment and like a booth, and then that will give you an entry. And you can do that with every one of our exhibitors. So you get a multiple entries to win the prize to Foxwoods Resort Casino. And again, as I was mentioning, Zoom Lounge Networking Room. After some of our speakers, they're continuing on into the networking room where you can meet up with them. And tomorrow we'll have dedicated networking time in both the morning and evening at the end of the program or afternoon, I should say, energy efficiency programs at Southern Connecticut Gas and United Illuminating, uh, part of the Avangrid family presenting our Zoom Lounge Networking Room. Um, I think we have our video uh, back corrected, so we'll uh, move over to that, and then we'll get to our panel in just a few moments. ...committed to your success. We're not just a vendor, we're your partner. Your team is foundational to your success, and we understand that finding the right candidate is about more than keywords on a resume, which is why we go beyond job boards and algorithms. It's about cultural fit, personality, experience, and so much more. 
you need someone who understands the vision. We are committed to providing you excellent customer service through clear communication and value-added information throughout the whole recruiting process. What challenging position can we help you fill? Protect the environment and help your local economy by using certified and environmentally validated biodiesel from American Green Fuels. Biodiesel is a renewable energy source made from recycled waste products, such as used cooking oil, which is converted into biodiesel at American Green Fuels and then blended into your heating oil. Biodiesel burns cleaner even in your current oil burner, so ask your oil retailer for biodiesel produced by American Green Fuels. You are what you heat. So you're a small business, or a big one. You were thriving. But then, oh, time to think, plan, pivot. How do you bounce back? You don't. You bounce forward with serious and reliable internet, powered by the largest gig speed network in America. But is it secure? Sure, it's secure. And even if the power goes down, your connection doesn't. So how do I do this? You don't do this. We do this together. Bounce forward with Comcast Business. The door to a car you've been saving for. The door to a personal loan that feels genuinely personal. The door to a bedroom for each of your teenagers. The door to a new employee who's also your neighbor. And the door to a happy and full life for you and everyone you know. This year, KeyBank has already opened over 170,000 doors, helping people get from where they were to where they wanted to be. KeyBank opens doors. We believe in the power of people to do what it takes, to stand strong, to meet challenges head on. At Kineticare, we help our members do just that. We're here when they need an ally clearing paths so they can see their doctors or get their medicine safely at home. And since Connecticut is our home too, we see the power in its people every day. Connecticut, powered by people for a healthier you. Could the underground water, sewer, and septic lines leading to your home be a ticking time bomb? If pipe damage occurs, you'll not only be in a mess, but you could end up paying thousands of dollars in repair bills. Don't wait until it's too late. Pipe Safe to the Rescue is here for you 24-7. The Regional Water Authority's trusted Pipe Safe Protection Program provides peace of mind for homeowners. For pennies a day, enroll in the RWA's Pipe Safe plans at pipe-safe.com or call 203-562-4020.